Well, happy Easter. How's everybody doing? Good, good, good. As Pastor John said, this is the fifth time uh, me sharing, and uh, so this is my, this is my final time uh, this weekend, and they've given me about 25 minutes to speak to you. And so I, I, I kind of feel like Henry VIII when he said to his sixth wife, I won't keep you very long. <laughs> so, uh, so, so this morning, I'd like for you to take your Bibles, if you got them, and turn with me to uh, Matthew chapter 28. And, and this morning, we're going we're gonna to talk about, uh, I, I want to look at this subject, what does Easter mean? Uh, what does it mean to you? What does it mean to me uh, in 2015? I mean, I, I think we know the historical significance of Easter. And, you know, George Gallup did, a, did a, a survey about 10 years ago and asked uh, adult Americans how many of them believe that Jesus rose from the dead. And uh, as he asked this question, 87% of adult Americans uh, believe that Jesus rose from the dead. And so as we look at this, I mean, obviously we understand that uh, the resurrection wasn't something that was done in a corner. It wasn't something that was done in a back alley or or something that was done uh, in, in secret, but it was, it was known in the entire world. And in fact, no sooner had Jesus risen from the dead, but all of Jerusalem knew uh, that he had risen from the dead. And then all of Rome, and then eventually all of the world. So, you know, this isn't something that, uh, that, that we don't believe. I mean, it, it, it is something we believe. And, and so, but what does it mean to us? I think, I think that's the question. What does it mean to, what does it mean to the... Uh, you know, to the, to the 20-year-old girl who's going to UNO and, and, and studying and, and hoping to pass her finals uh, in, in, in a few weeks? What does it mean to the guy that just retired and he's been working at, you know, the same company for 30 years and they gave him a gold watch and he's saying, well, you know, what do I do now? What does it mean to that family who, you know, both the, the husband and the wife, they work and they're just trying to make ends meet and, you know, trying to raise these children in, in, in the way that God would have them to raise them? What, I mean, what does it mean to you? What does it mean to me? And so this morning, that's what we're going to talk about, because I believe that, that, that the story of Easter, it has a lot to do with not just his, history, but it has to do with, with you and me here and now. And, and, and so we want to, we want to pull uh, some principles from the Word of God. Matthew chapter 28, if you don't have your Bibles, that's okay, uh, because we're going to have it on the screens. And we're just going to begin reading the Easter story. We're going to read Matthew chapter 28, verses 1 through 7. And uh, here's what I want to do. Uh, this morning, I want, to, I, I want to pull you into the story. If that's okay, um, I, I want you to, to, if you would, I want you to, I want you to imagine with me what it must have been like to, to be the two ladies that we're about to talk about, uh, because you know the, the term scripture it, it means to paint a picture, and so whenever you read the scripture, whenever you read the Word of God, uh, my encouragement to you is paint the picture in your mind and 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 see the faces that that the scriptures talking about and smell the smells and, 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 and feel the, the emotions that these, these, these people are going through. So uh, Matthew chapter 28, beginning in verse 1, if we can put that scripture up this morning. It says, after the Sabbath at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene, somebody say Mary Magdalene. Mary Magdalene. Now Mary Magdalene, when Jesus met her, was messed up. Somebody say messed up. Somebody say messed up. <laughs> Turn to your neighbor and tell him, I think he's talking about you. Uh, how many of you know, we're all messed up. We're all messed up. I mean, and this girl, she was messed up. She was so messed up. I mean, the Bible says she was, she was demon-possessed. And you can't really be very much more messed up than being demon-possessed. And she wasn't demon-possessed by one demon. She was demon-possessed by seven. And so she was messed up to the max. I mean, she, she, was, she was out there. And Jesus met her. Jesus set her free. Jesus changed her life. And aren't you glad that God is about changing lives? Aren't you glad that if God can change her, God can change you? Amen? Amen? And so, and so uh, turn to your neighbor and tell him, I told you he was talking about you. And so, <laughs> so, so, so this, this, this morning, the Bible says that there was this woman by the name of Mary Magdalene and the other Mary, so this is another Mary, two women, and, and you're going to see here in just a moment, these ladies, I mean, man, they are bold, they have guts, they are brave, they are powerful women because, because the Bible says... The Bible says that on the first day of the week at dawn, somebody say at dawn, at dawn. Now, if you don't know what that means, how, how, many, of you are, how many of you are at dawn people? 
See, this, this term, at dawn, it, 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 it has the idea, the same idea uh, of, of Matthew chapter 14, where the Bible says Jesus came to the disciples walking on the water at, uh, uh, during a time called the fourth watch of the night, which was somewhere between 3 and 6 a.m. So, so, so right now, as we look at this, this is somewhere between 3 and 6 a.m. How many of you operate between 3 and 6 a.m.? Okay, there they are. Those are the weird ones right there. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I, I'm one of you, okay? I mean, I like that. But most people, most people, they don't, they don't like between 3 and 6. Now, now understand, understand that these ladies, these, like I said, they were bad. I mean, they were, they, they, they got up. Now, understand. They, they didn't have electricity. They, they couldn't flip a switch, and all of a sudden, you know, the lights came on. I mean, they got up between 3 and 6 o'clock in the morning without the aid of electricity, without the aid of lights, without the aid of a flashlight, without the aid of, 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 of street lights, and they made their way out. I woke up at 4 o'clock this morning, and I was wide awake, and I, and I opened up my eyes, and my room was pitch black, and I started thinking about these guys. And I started thinking, you know what, would I get up right now and go out to a graveyard? And the answer is no. I would really, really, really have to love somebody to do that. I mean, this was Thelma and Louise right here. They were bad to the bone, these ladies. And so they got up, and the Bible says, on the first day of the week, Mary and the other Mary went <laughs> to look in the tomb. And as they went, there was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, going to the tomb, rolled back the stone, and sat on it. I want you to see that. They, he, he rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning. His clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. Now, these guards, these were an elite group of Roman guards. And these, the, the, this, this Roman, this Roman uh, group, this, this, the, I mean, they, were, they were like the Green Berets. They were like the Navy SEALs of their day. And they were put outside of the tomb because the Jews had said, Somebody's going to come and steal his, steal his body, and they're going to they're gonna, they're gonna say he rose from the dead, and they were afraid of that. And so they took this elite guard of, uh, uh, of Roman soldiers, and they placed them outside the tomb. And each one of these, each one of these soldiers was, was trained to, to protect 10 square feet of ground. And they would, they, they, they would line up one to another, and they would form this, this, this square outside the tomb. And so, and so this angel came, and and, and as the angel came, the Bible says that these guys were so scared. scared. I mean, they were so, they were so fraidy cats that they shook and became like dead men. I mean, they fell down. Thank you. Do I sound that bad? Or am I that dry? And the Bible says that they fell down, they shook, became like dead men, and the angel said to the women, do not be afraid, for I know who you're looking for, that you're looking for Jesus who was crucified. He's not here. He's risen. Some say he's risen. Just like he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go and quickly and tell his disciples he's risen from the dead. 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 I want to speak to you upon the subject this morning. What does Easter mean to us? What does Easter mean to us? Father, we thank you for your word. We just pray for the next few moments. Help me to bring it forth in a way that will be meaningful to the people. Father God, that you'd speak to our hearts, that you'd touch our lives. And when we leave here today, may we have learned something about you and learned something about Easter. May we have news that we can use, that it's not just a historical fact, but it has meaning for us today. I pray in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. Amen. It was August 1983, 23,000 feet above Denver, Colorado, there was a United Jet Boeing 747 that was cruising across the sky. And as this 747 was, 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 was jetting across the sky, they went through this, through this storm, and it was an electrical storm, and as they went through this storm, a lightning bolt struck the plane. As this lightning bolt struck the plane, all the power went out of the plane. And they went from 23,000 feet to 20,000 feet, from 20,000 feet to 17,000 feet, from 17,000 feet to 14,000 feet. Big, strong men 
were grabbing their armrests and their knuckles were turning white. Women were crying. As they went from 14,000 feet to 10,000 feet, as they hit 10,000 feet, all of a sudden, the lights came on, the plane leveled off, and in just a few seconds, the captain came on the intercom and he said, ladies and gentlemen, I am glad to tell you that power has been restored to the plane. How many of you know that's good news? Especially if you're in the plane. And this morning, I've got good news because that's what re the resurrection is about. It's about power that was lost, regained. And, tonight, and this morning, as we look into this resurrection story, again, my question to you is, what does it mean to you and me? And, and, and one of the things that fascinates me about the Easter story is the change that it made in the disciples. For the Bible tells us that one minute they're defeated, the next minute they're dynamic. One minute they're crushed, the next minute they're confident. One minute they're having a pity party, the next minute they're taking on the world. And my question is, what made the difference in their life? And the answer is the fact that Jesus Christ is alive and that resurrection is true and it's real. And so again, what does Easter mean for you and me in 2015? You see, I look at Easter and I, I see the power of God on display. I think the New Testament church knew that Easter meant the power of God because Paul wrote and he said that I might know him in the power of his resurrection. I think they knew that the resurrection meant the power of God because Paul would later on in another place write and say that if the spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you, it shall also make your mortal body alive. So Easter is the good news this morning that not only is our sin problem taken care of through the cross, but if you have a power problem, and if you're weak, and if you struggle, and if you make mistakes, and, and, and if you need the power of God to rise up and to be a better, a better wife, a better husband, a better mother, a better father, a better student, a better woman, a better man, if you need something more in your life, the good news is Jesus Christ came to infuse you with his power and to raise you up and to make you the man or the woman of God that not only he designed you to be, but that we desire to be. And so, 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 so this morning as we look into the story, there are two principles, there are two things that I want to draw from this story, and I want, to, I want to propose to you that this says to us two things today. Number one, it gives us the power to start over. Some say start over. And secondly, it gives us the power to do what we in our own strength cannot do. Let me say that again. Start over. Turn to your neighbor and say you can start over. So number one, we can start over. The second thing that this story tells us, and we might not see it, but it's in one verse. Uh, not only does it give us the power to start over, but it gives us the power. See, 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 Easter is God doing for us what we could never do for ourselves. You say, Pastor, where do you see that? Well, it's like I said, it's, it's right there in front of you. It's at the very first verse, verse, and it says, after the Sabbath, at dawn, on the first day of the week. Somebody say that with me. After Sabbath. At dawn, on the first day of the week. Now, that's the second point. Can we get the first one up there to start over? It says, after Sabbath, at dawn, on the first day of the week. Now, now, now see, we don't, we don't really see we can start over by just reading that. But if you'll understand that that last part of the phrase, the first day of the week, it's, it's pretty important. Because if you're a Christian, or if you've been around this, this thing for any length of time, you understand this is Holy Week. Some say Holy Week. Holy Week. And Holy Week starts with the, with, with the, the, the uh, uh, Palm Sunday. And it actually began last week. And for those of you that don't know what Palm Sunday is, Palm Sunday, you see, between Palm Sunday and Easter, that's called a holy week in Christianity, and there are like two billion people around the world right now that are celebrating with you and me. And people are meeting in cathedrals, and they're meeting in churches like this, and they're meeting in, they're meeting in uh, under shade trees in Africa, and I mean, just all over the place, and we're celebrating this thing called Holy Week, and, and, and today's Easter, but it started last week with Palm Sunday, and the Bible talks about Palm Sunday. And what was Palm Sunday, Pastor? Well, Palm Sunday was the day in which Jesus got on a donkey and he rode into Jerusalem and they cut down palm branches and they waved them before him and they said, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. 
And it was Jesus fulfilling the prophecy that said, Behold, your king comes on a donkey, the colt, and the foal of a donkey. And, 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 and so he was fulfilling that scripture, and that's Palm Sunday. Now, Palm Sunday starts Holy Week. I want you to see something. I'm going somewhere. Follow. We're going to put ourselves here. Okay, so, 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 so here's the deal. Palm Sunday starts Holy Week. That's the first day. Some say the first day. Well, if Sunday, last Sunday was the first day, then Monday must have been the, you guys are good. Somebody say second day. Tuesday must have been the, Wednesday the, Thursday the, Friday the, somebody say sixth day. Jesus was crucified on the, that's why we call it Good Friday, Okay. So he was crucified on the sixth day. Now, for those of you that may not, may, may not understand, six in, in the Bible, it's, it, it talks about the number of man. Because man was created on the sixth day. There will be a man of sin who will arise in the last days. His number will be six, six, six. So we understand that the number of six is the number of man. It's the number of imperfection. Man was made on the sixth day. Jesus, the son of man, came as a man to die for man on the day of man. Are you with me? So six is the day of man. Man was created on the sixth day. On the seventh day, God rested. Somebody say God rested. So Jesus was crucified on the sixth day for man, as a man, and he was laid in a tomb, and for that day, the Sabbath day, he rested. Come on, somebody. What was Jesus doing in the tomb? He was kicking back. What was was Jesus doing in the tomb? He was watching the final four. Rooting for Kentucky. No, I'm just teasing you. But, 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 but what, was, what was Jesus doing? Jesus was fulfilling who he was. He was God. God always rests on the seventh day. And so he rested on the seventh day. He died on the sixth day, rested on the seventh day, rose from the dead on the eighth day. Now, what does the number eight mean in Scripture? Here's what it means. It means new beginnings. It means you can start over. It means you get another chance. See, in Easter, Jesus was proclaiming. In Easter, Jesus was preaching. We may not see it, but we need to understand it, that when he rose on the eighth day, he said the number eight is the number of new beginnings. It's the number of starting over. It's the number of having another chance. It's the number of getting up and doing it over and having another shot at it. Woo! Thank you, God, we get another shot. Thank you, God, when I mess up, I can have another chance. Thank you, Jesus. I don't know about you, I mess up all the time. Oh, am I the only one? Some of you looking at me like, well, I never mess up. I mess up all the time. In fact, I, I, I lay in bed in the morning and I just tell my wife, I'm sorry. I was wrong. Please forgive me. See, those are the nine words that will save your marriage. I was wrong. I am sorry. Please forgive me. And so we're laying in bed and I just say, honey, I'm sorry. I'm, I, I was wrong. Please forgive me. She says, for what? I said, I don't know, but I'm going to do something today. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> How many of you remember the days before iPads? Two of you. All the rest of you teenagers, you don't know what I'm talking about right now. How many of you remember before iPhones? How many of you remember before Xboxes? You remember before Playstations? Yeah, yeah. See, see, young people, you don't understand. There was a time. I know you can't imagine it. I know you cannot fathom. But there was a time before Apple, a time before iPads and iPhones and Xboxes and Playstations. There was a time when people my age had to use their imaginations to play. You understand what I'm talking about? 
We had to actually engage our minds and go outside. Where the sun would be shining. And these things that have leaves, they're called trees, would be growing. And we'd go out and we'd find a stick and we would turn it into a rocket launcher. Sticks became machine guns, rocket launchers, rocks became grenades, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. And there were cool toys back then. I had a laptop before laptops existed. They were called Etch-a-Sketches. Yeah. You don't even know what an Etch-a-Sketch is, do you? Look like this. Still got mine, baby. Oh, yeah, yeah, Etch-a-Sketches are awesome. I mean, man, you can, you can go diagonal, you can go horizontal, just don't, just, I mean, you, you can go vertical, horizontal, you just can't go diagonal. If you go out diagonal, it's going to mess you up. You can't backtrack because it's going to leave two lines. But here's the cool thing. If you mess up, <laughs> used, to be, used to be my cheeks didn't do this when I did this, but now it does. If you mess up, you just... What are you saying, Pastor? I'm saying this, man. If you mess up in your life, God's got a big etch-a-sketch in the sky, and he can do this. He can wipe out your mistake. He can wipe out your mess up. He can wipe out your unforgiveness. He can wipe out the thing that happened to you. God can take your life, and he can wash it clean by the blood of the Lamb. Hallelujah. There's a reason these things are red. Oh, yeah. God wants to wash you. Somebody say he can forgive you. So we say you can start over. Amen. So number one, you can start over. Number two, the second thing that I see here is that God will do for you what you cannot do for yourself. You say, where do you see that, Pastor? Well, let's look at the scripture. The Bible says after dawn, or excuse me, after the Sabbath at dawn, there was a violent earthquake for the angel of the Lord came down from heaven, going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. Whew. Now, Like I said, I want to invite you into the story. Imagine you're with Mary and Mary, and you're on your way to the tomb. Now, here's the cool thing. They're on their way to the tomb, and they've got a plan. Some say they got a plan. Now, you know they were women because they had a plan. (laughs) Hello? Men, 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 they wouldn't have had a plan. Men would have said, let's go check it out. We'll figure it out once we get there, man. But no, 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 not, not these ladies. These ladies had a plan. These ladies had, they had the spices. They were going to anoint Jesus' body. They had the oil. They were going to anoint Jesus' body. I mean, they, and, and, they, and, and as they were going, I can just imagine them talking about, okay, who's going to roll away the stone? I mean, these were a couple of ladies. Now, I'm not saying ladies couldn't roll away the stone, but this stone was like 250 pounds. And that was, that was if it was a small stone. There were other stones, scholars say, that weighed up to 1,000 pounds. So here's the deal. These ladies had a problem. And they didn't know how they were going to fix it. And I'm sure they must have been discussing, once we get there, how are we going to roll away the stone? How are we going to get to God? Because there's a barrier keeping us from getting to God. Who's going to roll away the stone? How are we going to do this? And as they turn the corner and as they see the tomb, lo and behold, what has happened is the stone has already been rolled away. The the, the, the guards are laying on the ground and the angel is sitting on top of the stone. What does this say to you and me in 2015? It says this. Just like God had already taken care of the problem before they got there, and God did 
what they could not do for them even before they needed it done. God has taken care of our problems and he has done for us what we could never do for ourselves and he has taken care of us even before we knew we needed to be taken care of. I'm here to say that the resurrection it yells at us and it says it says this, that God has done for you what you could never do for yourself. God has provided for you what you could never provide for yourself. God through the resurrection has through the cross has provided forgiveness and deliverance and power and anointing and grace for you and me. He's given us stuff we could never give ourselves. So today God comes and he says, look, you can never forgive yourself. You can never change yourself. You can never set yourself free. See, some of us are messed up. Some of us are struggling in this place and we're addicts. Whether we're we're addicted to to alcohol or whether we're addicted to pornography or whether we're addicted to drugs or whether we're we're, we're addicted to, to something else. You see, some of us in this place are messed up. There are mothers in this place that can't forgive themselves because they've done things to their babies that that no mother should ever do, and they've said things that no mother should ever say. There are some guys in this place that you've messed up, and you've done things, and you'd be ashamed if we knew. See, 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 today there's a lot of messed up people in this place, and I'm one of them because we all mess up, and we all make mistakes and they're all things that we've done and, and things we can't, we can't rectify on our own. And God comes and he says, look, I've done it for you. That's what the cross is all about. I've forgiven you and I've provided forgiveness for you. I've provided deliverance for you. And I've got the power for you to live a life that you could never live on your own. And so that's what the resurrection is about. And it means something in 2015 to you. It means something to me. And this morning, I don't have any more time, but let me, let me read you a poem and we're done. It was written by a young man named Stephen Furtick, and I just want you to listen to it, and I pray that it speaks to you like it spoke to me, and it's called God Sent a Savior. Some say God sent a Savior. Come on, say it like you mean it. God sent a Savior. Now, here's what I'm going to do. All throughout this poem, it comes to a point where it says God sent a Savior, and here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to get to that point, and I'm going to say, so God, and you're going to say, sent a savior let's try it so god okay good 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 in the fullness of time god looked down on the crown jewel of his creation and he said these people are the apple of my eye but somehow they've managed to mess things up every time so i'm going to have to go down and i'm going to have to fix this thing myself so god God said, the man I've made has messed up my image. He's distorted my intentions and diluted my instructions. Humanity has been reduced to naked shame, eyes wide open beholding a once paradise now locked up tightly. So God said, I need somebody with nimble fingers, somebody who can sow more than fig leaves, somebody who can seamlessly weave broken, the broken heart of humanity back together again. Somebody to silence the lies of all the snakes in their lives. I need somebody whose mouth has never tasted the poisonous bite of forbidden fruit. Someone to pull the tree of knowledge up by the roots and carry it on his own back. So God sent a savior. God said they need a chain breaker. The cries of my people in bondage are rising up before me. And the sound of their wailing have pierced the portals of heaven. So I'm sending a deliverer to put an end to their days of back-breaking, brick-making. God said they need somebody that can deliver them from dungeons and demons, from corners and caves, all the things that they have made and have been enslaved by. So God sent a Savior. God said they need an overcomer. They need somebody who has a clean closet that is skeleton-free. They need somebody with a story that has no imperfections and a heart that has no ill motives. I need somebody with steadfast sincerity and relentless resolve. God said, I need a perfect lamb with the kind of confidence that makes its bed in the bed of lions. 
God said, I need somebody who can grab fear by the throat and render it powerless. I need someone who will shout the, shut the mouth of every liar, who will wield the heart of kings and silence the roar of the enemy. God said, I need somebody who can pray prayers and sweat blood even in the garden of Gethsemane. So God sent a Savior. God said they need a water walker whose voice kills the wind and the waves. I need a man, God said, with perfect faith who can navigate the rise and fall of chaotic conditions. God said, I need a man who can point the way through the clouds of doubt when the boat is breaking up and the storms are raging on. I need a man who's steady on his feet, trained to tread the surface of the deep. I need a man who refuses to accept that walking is an activity reserved just for dry land. God said, I need somebody who believes that living fluid and walking in faith go hand in hand. Somebody bold enough to place the ball of his foot on uncertainty. A peacemaker with a firm grip. Someone strong enough to catch a slipping, sinking soul and carry that one that wavers back to the boat. So God sent a Savior. God said, I need a perfect son, one with the skills to lead a search party. I need someone for every runaway and renegade, somebody to retrieve and redeem all my lost sons and daughters. God said, I need someone to remind the world that no matter what they've done, where they've been, or how low they've fallen, even to the pig pen, they still have a chance to be called my kids. God said, I need somebody who knows how to throw a welcome party. I need somebody willing to light the grill and kill the fatted calf in celebration of the one who still smells like the swine he slept with last night. God said, I need somebody who is willing to bury the rebellion of the world in the righteousness of his redemption. So God sent a Savior. God said, I need a grave robber. Somebody who can bear to be bruised by the knuckles and bear to be maligned by the echoes of sinful man that he himself created. God said, I need a man who will stare back into the faces of stone with a compassion carved more deeply than the canyons that he constructed by his word. God said, I need somebody who will not utter a word, but be silent like a lamb led to the slaughter. I need somebody who can be beaten beyond recognition and buried in a borrowed tomb and still get up with a presence of mind to fold the strips of linen that he himself is leaving behind. God said, I need a morning person who can wake up after three days and stretch a little, then roll his own stone away. I need somebody to change the game of hide and seek and say, don't come to this grave looking for me. God said, I need someone who will walk into the ring with death and hand it its first and final defeat. God said, I need a hero. I need a conqueror. I need someone who knows where death and hell live and has the keys and who has the power to shake them down. God said, I need someone who can take them by force. I need a man who will strip shame bare and exchange it for grace. One who will shatter every shackle and with one word bring liberation. One who will revive lost passion for the greatness of his name. One who who redirects his attentions and stares fear in the face. I need one who will walk beyond every doubt and against every wind stand unafraid. God said, I need one who recovers sons and daughters and restores them to their rightful place. God said, I need a resurrector. I need somebody who has life. I need somebody who is alive. And today, I've got good news. God has his man. God sent his man. His man died. His man was buried. His man rose from the dead on that third day. His name is Jesus. praise him in this house. Somebody stand with me and worship him in this house. Oh, hallelujah. 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 Oh, we bless you, Lord. Please remain standing this morning.
you please bow your heads? And as you bow your heads today, you say, Pastor, Pastor, I've never been to an Easter service like this. I've never felt what I feel in this place. Well, this morning, I'm sorry to hear that. Because what you feel is you feel a God who's alive. And who's not dead. Who doesn't, we, we don't serve a dead, boring, dry, religious Jesus who's still on the cross. But this morning we serve a risen King of kings and Lord of lords. And the fact that he's alive means that you and I can live too. Just like the, the scripture brought out this morning, we can start over. Because he rose on the eighth day. And he was preaching to us saying, you can start again. Today there are some of you that you need the power of God. And you need God to do something for you that you cannot do for yourself. And that's what Easter's all about. So as our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed and nobody's looking around, how many of you would be honest enough? Man enough, woman enough? To say, Pastor, I think you're speaking ju ju just directly to me. I feel like this entire service, you've just been talking to me. Nobody else has been here. That's okay. It's the Holy Spirit that's talking to you. It's not me. It's God. And there's some of you, you think, you think you came because it's Easter? You think you came because Mama told you you needed to come? You think you came because a friend invited you? Can I tell you why you really came? Our heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Nobody's looking around. Let me tell you why you really came. You came today because God brought you here. That's why you came. You thought you made the decision, but really it was God working on your heart to bring you here. Why? Because he wanted to tell you he loves you. He has a plan for your life. And if you've messed up, he's got a huge etch-a-sketch that can wash, wash away your sin. It's called the blood of Jesus. And he wants to give you power so that you can be the person of your dreams and of his plan. And so tonight, today, as our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed, how many of you would say, you'd be honest enough just to say, Pastor, you know what? I'm like you. I've messed up a thousand times, and I need Jesus to forgive me because there's something in my life, there's something that I've done. I've lied, I've stolen, I've cheated. I've, I don't know what it is you've done. We've all done something. Because the Bible says there's none of us that are good. There's none of us that are righteous. We're all messed up. But maybe you're here today and you've never asked Jesus to forgive you. You've never asked Jesus to come into your heart to change your life. And that's why you're here. And so please don't leave today without praying this prayer with me. And I'm going to pray it right now. And I'm going to pray it with you. And if you want to pray this prayer, and if you'd be, you'd be honest enough to say, Pastor, Please pray with me. I need, I need that prayer. I want to pray that prayer. I want to give my heart to Jesus. If that's, your, if that's you today, would you do me a favor? As every head is bowed, every eye is closed, I just want to know who I'm praying with this morning. So if that's you this morning, do me a favor and just right now, right where you're at, put your hand up and put it back down. I need prayer. I need Jesus. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you all over this place. Come on. Lift it up. Put it back down. Lift it up. Put it back down. Lift it up. Put it back down. I need Jesus. I need Jesus. I need Jesus. I need Jesus. God bless you. So many people in this place. Maybe you didn't raise your hand, but you know you need to. That's okay. I'm going to pray with you right where you're at. And here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I'm going to ask you to forget about everybody around you. And I'm going to ask all these Christians that are in this place today, I'm going to ask you to help us to pray. And we're going to pray a simple prayer. And can I tell you, 36 years ago, I prayed this prayer. And Jesus, he, he, he wrecked my life for good. He changed me forever. When I prayed this prayer, I was out drinking and smoking dope with my buddies. I was selling, I was selling weed at the time. I prayed this prayer and Jesus changed my life. And Jesus set me on a path and I've never regretted it. And God wants to do the same for you. He wants to change your life. So as our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed, we're gonna pray this prayer and I want you to pray it from your heart. And as you pray it from your heart, God's going to hear you. Pray this prayer with me. Pray it out loud. Jesus, come on, say it out loud. Jesus, I know that I need you. I need your forgiveness. I need you to come into my life. I need you to change me. Please wash me 
in your blood. Cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Come into my heart and change me by your power. I give you my past, all my mistakes. Wash them. Cleanse me. Take them away. I give you my present. Everything I am is yours. And God, I give you my future. All that I'll ever be, I give it to you. Take my life. Come into my heart. Change me by your power. Take me by the hand from this day forward. Lead me, guide me in path of righteousness for your name's sake. Thank you, Lord, that I'm yours by faith in Jesus' name. Now let me pray for you. Father, I God, I, I thank you for each one that prayed that prayer. And Lord God, I pray that you would take them by the hand, that you would make them the men and women of God that you destined them to be. You created them, Lord God, to know you and to serve you. And so, Lord God, I pray that from this day forward, you would take them by the hand, make them the men and women of God you created them to be. The men and women that you dreamed they could be when you created them. And Lord, I pray that you would just have your way in their lives. And may the power of God, that same power that we talked about today, the power that raised Jesus from the dead, the power that changed the disciples' lives and caused them to, to, live, to move from fear to faith and from cowardice to, to courage. Father God, may that same power be exhibited in the hearts and lives of your people as we turn our hearts over to you. We say, God, have your way, and we thank you. You've forgiven us. Now fill us with your spirit and make us the people you dream we could be. We ask in Jesus' name. And all God's people said amen. Amen.